Jeronchen by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Thou hast nor youth nor age, but as it were an after dinner sleep, dreaming of both. Here I am, an old man in a dry month, being read to by a boy, waiting for rain. I was neither at the hot gates, nor fought in the warm rain, nor knee-deep in the salt marsh, heaving a cutlass, bitten by flies, fought. My house is a decayed house, and the Jew squats on the window-sill. The owner spawned in some estaminet of Antwerp, blistered in Brussels, patched and peeled in London. The goat coughs at night in the field overhead rocks moss stone crop iron murds the woman keeps the kitchen makes tea sneezes at evening poking the peevish gutter i am an old man a dull head among windy spaces signs are taken for wonders would you see a sign the word within a word unable to speak a word swaddled with darkness in the juvescence of the year came christ the tiger in depraved may dogwood and chestnut flowering judas to be eaten to be divided to be drunk among whispers by mr silvero with caressing hands at images who walked all night in the next room by hakayama bowing among the tessians by madame de tornquist in the dark room shifting the candles fraulein von Kolp who turned in the hall one hand on the door vacant shuttles weave the wind i have no ghosts an old man in a drafty house under a windy knob after such knowledge what forgiveness think now history has many cunning passages contrived corridors and issues deceives with whispering ambitions guides us by vanities think now she gives when our attention is distracted and what she gives gives with such supple confusions that the giving famishes the craving gives too late what's not believed in or if still believed in memory only reconsidered passion gives too soon into weak hands what's thought can be dispensed with till the refusal propagates a fear think neither fear nor courage saves us unnatural vices are fathered by our heroism virtues are forced upon us by our impudent crimes these tears are shaken from the wrath-bearing tree the tiger springs in the new year us he devours think at last we have not reached conclusion when i stiffen in a rented house think at last i have not made this show purposelessly and it is not by any consultation of the backward devils i would meet you upon this honestly i that was near your heart was removed therefrom to lose beauty in terror terror in inquisition i have lost my passion why should i need to keep it since what is kept must be adulterated i have lost my sight smell hearing taste and touch how should i use it for your closer contact these with a thousand small deliberations protract the profit of their chilled delirium excite the membrane when the sense has cooled with pungent sauces multiply variety in a wildness of mirrors what will the spider do suspend its operation will the weevil delay de belhatke fresca mrs cannell whirled beyond the circuit of the shuddering bear and fractured atoms gull against the wind in the windy straits of belle isle or running on the horn white feathers in the snow the gulf claims and an old man driven by the trades to a sleepy corner tenants of the house thoughts of a dry brain in a dry season in the poem this recording is in the public domain burbank with a bidecker blystein with a cigar by t s eliot read for librivox by matt benzing of oxford ohio 
Tra la 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 la. Nil nisi divinum stabili est, cetera fumus. The gondola stopped. The old palace was there. How charming its gray and pink. Goats and monkeys with such hair, too. So the countess passed on until she came through the little park where Niobe presented her with a cabinet and so departed. Burbank crossed a little bridge, descending at a small hotel. Princess Volupine arrived. They were together, and he fell. Defunctive music under sea passed seaward with the passing bell slowly. The god Hercules had left him that had loved him well. The horses, under the axle tree, beat up the dawn from Istria with even feet. Her shuttered barge burned on the water all the day. But this or such was Bleistein's way, a saggy bending of the knees and elbows with the palms turned out, Chicago Semite Viennese. A lusterless, protrusive eye stares from the protozoic slime at a perspective of Canaletto. The smoky candle end of time declines. On the Rialto once. The rats are underneath the piles. The Jew is underneath the lot. Money in furs. The boatman smiles. Princess Volopine extends a meager, blue-nailed, philistic hand to climb the water stair. Lights, lights. She entertains Sir Ferdinand Klein. Who clipped the lion's wings and fleed his rump and pared his claws, thought Burbank, meditating on time's ruins and the seven laws. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. Sweeney Erect by T. S. Eliot Read for LibriVox.org by Matt Benzing of Oxford, Ohio. Sweeney Erect And the trees about me, let them be dry and leafless. Let the rocks groan with continual surges, and behind me make all a desolation. Look, look, wenches. Paint me a cavernous waste shore, cast in the unstilled cyclades, paint me the bold and fracturous rocks faced by the snarled and yelping seas. Display me, Aeolus, above, reviewing the insurgent gales which tangle Aeridne's hair and swell with haste the perjured sails. Morning stirs the feet and hands, Narcissa and Polypheme. Gesture of orangutan rises from the sheets in steam. This withered root of knots of hair slitted below and gashed with eyes. This oval O cropped out with teeth. The sickle motion from the thighs jackknifes upward at the knees, then straightens out from heel to hip, pushing the framework of the bed and clawing at the pillow slip. Sweeney addressed full length to shave, broad-bottomed, pink from nape to base, knows the female temperament, and wipes the suds around his face. The lengthened shadow of a man is history, said Emerson, who had not seen the silhouette of Sweeney straddled in the sun. Test the razor on his leg, waiting until the shriek subsides. The epileptic on the bed curves backward, clutching at her sides. The ladies of the corridor find themselves involved, disgraced, call witness to their principles and deprecate the lack of taste, observing that hysteria might easily be misunderstood. Mrs. Turner intimates it does the house no sort of good. But Doris, toweled from the bath, enters padding on broad feet bringing sal volatile and a glass of brandy neat. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
A Cooking Egg by T.S. Eliot, read for LibriVox.org by Eva Tavis. A mon trente et un de mon ange, que toutes mes hontes j'ai bu. Pippet sate upright in her chair, some distance from where I was sitting. Views of the Oxford colleges lay on the table with the knitting. Daguerreotypes and silhouettes, her grandfather and great great aunts, supported on the mantelpiece an invitation to the dance i shall not want honour in heaven for i shall meet sir philip sidney and have talk with coriolanus and other heroes of that kidney i shall not want capital in heaven for i shall meet sir alfred mond we two shall lie together lapped in a five per cent exchequer bond i shall not want society in heaven lucretia borgia shall be my bride her anecdotes will be more amusing than Pippet's experience could provide. I shall not want Pippet in heaven. Madame Blavatsky will instruct me in the seven sacred trances. Picarda de Donati will conduct me. But where is the penny world I bought to eat with Pippet behind the screen? The red-eyed scavengers are creeping from Kentish town and Golders Green. Where are the eagles and the trumpets? Buried beneath some snow-deep alps, Over buttered scones and crumpets, Weeping, weeping multitudes, Droop in a hundred ABCs. Footnote. ABCs signifies endemic tea shops Found in all parts of London. The initials signify Aerated Bread Company Limited. End footnote. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Le Directeur by T.S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Fytak, Los Angeles. Le Directeur. Malheur à la malheureuse Tamise. Tamise qui coule si près du spectateur. Le Directeur conservateur du spectateur empeste la brise les actionnaires réactionnaires du spectateur conservateur bras dessus bras dessous font des tours à pas de loup dans un égout une petite fille en guenille camarde regarde le directeur du spectateur conservateur et crève d'amour end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Mélange adultère de tout by T.S. Eliot Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Fytak, Los Angeles Mélange adultère de tout En Amérique, professeur En Angleterre, journaliste c'est à grand pas et en sueur que vous suivrez à peine ma piste. En Yorkshire, conférencier. À Londres, un peu banquier. Vous me paierez bien la tête. C'est à Paris que je me coiffe, casque noir de je m'en foutiste. En Allemagne, philosophe. Surexcité par emport ébène au grand air de Bergsteigleben. Gère toujours de ci, de là, à divers coups de tralala, de Damas jusqu'à Omaha. Je célébrais mon jour de fête dans une oasis d'Afrique, vêtue d'une peau de girafe. On montrera mon cénotaphe aux côtes brûlantes de Mozambique. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lune de Miel by T.S. Eliot Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Fytak, Los Angeles Lune de Miel Ils ont vu les Pays-Bas, ils rentrent à terre haute. Mais une nuit d'été, les voici à Ravenne, à sur le dos écartant les genoux de quatre jambes molles tout gonflées de morsures. On relève le drap pour mieux égratigner moins d'une lieue d'ici et Saint Apollinaire, en classe, basilique, comme des amateurs, de chapiteaux d'acanthe que tournait le vent. Ils vont prendre le train de huit heures 
prolonger leur misère de Padoue à Milan, où se trouvent le Seine et un restaurant pas cher. Lui pense au pourboire et redige son bilan. Ils auront vu la Suisse et traversé la France. Et Saint Apollinaire, raide et ascétique, vieille usine désaffectée de Dieu, tient encore dans ses pierres écroulantes la forme précise de Byzance. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Hippopotamus by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Matt Benzing of Oxford, Ohio. The Hippopotamus. Similitur et omnes reverentur diaconos, ut mandatum Jesu Christi et episcopum ut Jesum Christum existentem filiam Petrus. Presbyteros autoium, ut concilium de et conjunctionum apostolorum, sin his ecclesiaste non vocator, de quiebus suedeo vos sic habio, es inertia ad tradienos. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. The broad-backed hippopotamus rests on his belly in the mud. Although he seems so firm to us, he is merely flesh and blood. Flesh and blood is weak and frail, susceptible to nervous shock, while the true church can never fail, for it is based upon a rock. The hippo's feeble steps may err, encompassing material ends, while the church need never stir to gather its dividends. The potamus can never reach the mango on the mango tree, but fruits of pomegranate and peach refresh the church from oversea. At mating time, the hippo's voice betrays inflections hoarse and odd, but every week we here rejoice the church at being one with God. The hippopotamus's day is passed in sleep. At night he hunts. God works in a mysterious way. The church can sleep and feed at once. I saw the potamus take wing, ascending from the damp savannas, and choiring angels round him sing the praise of God in loud hosannas. Blood of the Lamb shall wash him clean, and him shall heavenly arms enfold. Among the saints he shall be seen performing on a harp of gold. He shall be washed as white as snow by all the martyred virgins kiss while the true church remains below, wrapped in the old miasmal mist. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. Dans le Restaurant by T.S. Eliot Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Fytak, Los Angeles dans le restaurant, le garçon délabré qui n'a rien à faire que de se gratter les doigts et se pencher sur mon épaule. Dans mon pays, il fera tant pluvieux, du vent, du grand soleil et de la pluie. C'est ce qu'on appelle le jour de lessive des gueux. Bavard, baveux, à la croupe arrondie, je te prie au moins, ne bave pas dans la soupe. Les saules trempés et des bourgeons sur les ronces. C'est là, dans une averse, qu'on s'abrite. J'avais sept ans. Elle était plus petite. Elle était toute mouillée. Je lui ai donné des primavères. Les taches de son gilet montent au chiffre de trente-huit. Je la chatouillais pour la faire rire. J'éprouvais un instant de puissance et de délire. Mais alors, vieux lubrique, à cet âge... « Monsieur, le fait est dur. Il est venu nous peloter un gros chien. Moi, j'avais peur. Je l'ai quitté à mi-chemin. <rire> C'est dommage. Mais alors, tu as ton vautour. Va-t'en te décrotter les rides du visage. Tiens, ma fourchette, décrase-toi le crâne. De quel droit paies-tu des expériences comme moi Tiens, voilà dix sous pour la salle de bain. 
Phlébas, le phénicien, pendant quinze jours noyés, oubliait les cris des mouettes et la houle de Cornouailles, et les profits et les pertes et la cargaison des thyms. Un courant de sous-mer l'emporta très loin, le repassant aux étapes de sa vie antérieure. Figurez-vous donc, c'était un sort pénible. Cependant, ce fut jadis un bel homme de haute taille. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Whispers of Immortality by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox by Farno Jahangir. Webster was much possessed by death and saw the skull beneath the skin and breathless creatures on the ground lean backward with a lipless grin. Daffodil bulbs instead of balls stirred from the sockets of the eyes. He knew that thought clings round the limbs tightening its lusts and luxuries. Don, I suppose, was such another who found no substitute for sense to seize and clutch and penetrate, expert beyond experience. He knew the anguish of the marrow, the ague of the skeleton, no contact possible to flesh allay the fever of the bone. Grishkin is nice, her Russian eye is underlined for emphasis, uncorseted her friendly bust gives promise of pneumatic bliss. The couched Brazilian jaguar composed the scampering marmoset. With subtle influence of cat, Grishkin has a maisonette. The sleek Brazilian jaguar does not, in its arboreal gloom, distill so rank a feline smell as Grishkin in a drawing room. And even the abstract entities circumambulate her charm, but our lot crawls between dry lips to keep our metaphysics warm. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mr. Eliot's Sunday Morning Service by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Look, look, master, here comes two religious caterpillars, the Jew of Malta, polyphiloprogenitive, the sapient settlers of the Lord, drift across the window panes. In the beginning was the word, superfetation of Ta'am, and the menstrual turn of time, produced innervet origin. A painter of the Umbrian school designed upon a gesso ground the nimbus of the baptized God. The wilderness is cracked and browned. But through the water, pale and thin, still shine the unoffending feet, and there above the painter set the father and the paraclete. The sable presbyters approach the avenue of penitence. The young are red and pustular, clutching peaculative pence. Under the penitential gates, sustained by staring seraphim, where the souls of the devout burn invisible and dim. Along the garden wall, the bees with hairy bellies pass between the staminate and pistillate, blessed office of the epicene. Sweeney shifts from ham to ham, stirring the water in his bath. The masters of the subtle school are controversial polymath. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sweeney Among the Nightingales by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Farno Jahangiri. Apenex Sweeney spreads his knees, letting his arms hang down to laugh. The zebra stripes along his jaw, swelling to maculate giraffe. The circles of the stormy moon slide westward toward the river plate. Death and the raven drift above, and Sweeney guards the hornate gate. Gloomy Orion and the dog are the veiled and hushed the shrunken seas. The person in the Spanish cape tries to sit on Sweeney's knees. Slips and pulls the tablecloth, overturns the coffee cup, reorganized upon the floor, she yawns and draws a stocking up. The silent man in mocha brown 
sprawls at the window sill and gapes. The waiter brings in oranges, bananas, figs, and hot house grapes. The silent vertebrate in brown contracts and concentrates, withdraws. Rachel Ney Rabinovich tears at the grapes with murderous paws. She and the lady in the cave are suspect thought to be in league. Therefore the man with heavy eyes declines the gambit, shows fatigue, leaves the room and reappears outside the window leaning in. Branches of wisteria circumscribe a golden green. The host with someone indistinct converses at the door apart. The nightingales are singing near the convent of the sacred heart and sang within the bloody wood when Agamemnon cried aloud and let their liquid droppings fall to stain the stiff dishonored shroud. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T. S. Eliot Read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis Si io credesse che mia risposta fosse a persona che mai tornasse al mondo, questa fiamma staria senza più scose, ma per ciò che giamai di questo fondo non torno vivo alcun, si odo il vero, senza tema d'infamio ti rispondo. Let us go, then, you and I. When the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table, let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house, and fell asleep. And indeed, there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you, and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions, and for a hundred visions and revisions, before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare, and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair, with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say, how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voice is dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a further room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin? to spit out all the butt-ends of my days and ways. 
and how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor, here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worth while to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one, settling a pillow by her head, should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. And would it have been worth it, after all? Would it have been worthwhile, after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this, and so much more? It is impossible to say just what I mean, but as if a magic lantern threw the nerves and patterns on a screen, would it have been worth while if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all, that is not what I meant at all. Now, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be, am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two. Advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times, the fool. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled, Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back. When the wind blows the water white and black, we have lingered in the chambers of the sea, by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown, till human voices wake us and we drown. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Portrait of a Lady by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Thou hast committed fornication, but that was in another country, and besides, the wench is dead. The Jew of Malta. 1. Among the smoke and fog of a December afternoon, you have the scene arranged itself, as if it will seem to do, with 
I have saved this afternoon for you. And four wax candles in the darkened room, four rings of light upon the ceiling overhead, an atmosphere of Juliet's tomb prepared for all the things to be said or left unsaid. We have been, let us say, to hear the latest pole transmit the preludes through his hair and fingertips. So intimate, this Chopin, that I think his soul should be resurrected only among friends, some two or three, who will not touch the bloom that is rubbed and questioned in the concert room. And so the conversation slips among velities and carefully caught regrets, through attenuated tones of violins mingled with remote cornets, and begins. You do not know how much they mean to me, my friends, and how, how rare and strange it is to find in a life composed so much, so much of odds and ends. For indeed I do not love it. You knew? You are not blind. How keen you are! To find a friend who has these qualities, who has and gives these qualities upon which friendship lives. How much it meant that I say this to you. Without these friendships, life, what cauchemar! Among the windings of the violins and the ariettes of cracked cornets, inside my brain a dull tom-tom begins, absurdly hammering a prelude of its own, capricious monotone that is at least one definite false note. Let us take the air in a tobacco trance, admire the moments, discuss the late events, correct our watches by the public clocks, then sit for half an hour and drink our box. 2. Now that lilacs are in bloom, she has a bowl of lilacs in her room, and twists one in her fingers while she talks. Ah, my friend, you do not know, you do not know what life is, you should hold it in your hands. Slowly twisting the lilac stalks. You let it flow from you. You let it flow, and youth is cruel and has no remorse, and smiles at situations which it cannot see. I smile, of course, and go on drinking tea. Yet with these April sunsets that somehow recall my buried life, and Paris in the spring, I feel immeasurably at peace and find the world to be wonderful and youthful after all. The voice returns like the insistent out of tune of a broken violin on an August afternoon. I am always sure that you understand my feelings, always sure that you feel, sure that across the gulf you reach your hand. You are invulnerable. You have no Achilles heel. You will go on, and when you have prevailed you can say, at this point many a one has failed. But what have I? But what have I, my friend, to give you? What can you receive from me? Only the friendship and the sympathy of one about to reach her journey's end. I shall sit here serving tea to friends. I take my hat. How can I make a cowardly amends for what she has said to me? You will see me any morning in the park, reading the comics and the sporting page. Particularly, I remark, an English countess goes upon the stage. A Greek was murdered at a Polish dance. Another bank defaulter has confessed. I keep my countenance. I remain self-possessed, except when a street piano, mechanical and tired, reiterates some worn-out common song with the smell of hyacinths across the garden, recalling things that other people have desired. Are these ideas right or wrong? 3. The October night comes down, returning as before except for a slight sensation of being ill at ease. I mount the stairs and turn the handle of the door, and I feel as if I had mounted on my hands and knees. And so you are going abroad, and when do you return? But that's a useless question. You hardly know when you are coming back. You will find so much to learn. A smile falls heavily among the bric-a-brac. Perhaps you can write to me. My self-possession flares up for a second. This is as I had reckoned. I have been wondering frequently of late, but our beginnings never know our ends. Why we have not developed into friends. I feel like one who smiles and turning shall remark suddenly his expression in a glass. My self-possession gutters. We are really in the dark. 
for everybody said so all our friends they all were sure our feelings would relate so closely i myself can hardly understand we must leave it now to fate you will write at any rate perhaps it is not too late i shall sit here serving tea to friends and i must borrow every changing shape to find expression dance dance like a dancing bear cry like a parrot chatter like an ape let us take the air in a tobacco trance well and what if she should die some afternoon afternoon gray and smoky evening yellow and rose should die and leave me sitting pen in hand with the smoke coming down above the housetops doubtful for quite a while not knowing what to feel or if i understand or whether wise or foolish tardy or too soon would she not have the advantage after all this music is successful with a dying fall now that we talk of dying and should i have the right to smile in the poem this recording is in the public domain Preludes by T. S. Eliot, read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. The winter evening settles down with smell of stakes and passageways. Six o'clock, the burnt-out ends of smoky days, and now a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps of withered leaves about your feet and newspapers from vacant lots. The showers beat on broken blinds and chimney pots, and at the corner of the street a lonely cab horse steams and stamps, and then the lighting of the lamps. The morning comes to consciousness of faint stale smells of beer from the sawdust trampled street with all its muddy feet that press to early coffee stands with the other masquerades that time resumes one thinks of all the hands that are raising dingy shades in a thousand furnished rooms you tossed a blanket from the bed you lay upon your back and waited you dozed and watched the night revealing the thousand sordid images of which your soul was constituted they flickered against the ceiling and when all the world came back and the light crept up between the shutters and you heard the sparrows in the gutters you had such a vision of the street as a street hardly understands sitting along the bed's edge where you curled the papers from your hair or clasped the yellow soles of feet in the palms of both soiled hands his soul stretched tight across the skies that fade behind a city block or trampled by insistent feet at four and five and six o'clock and short square fingers stuffing pipes in evening newspapers and eyes assured of certain certainties the conscience of a blackened street impatient to assume the world i am moved by fancies that are curled around these images and cling the notion of some infinitely gentle infinitely suffering thing wipe your hand across your mouth and laugh the worlds revolve like ancient women gathering fuel in vacant lots end a poem this recording is in the public domain Rhapsody on a Windy Night by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. Twelve o'clock. Along the reaches of the street held in a lunar synthesis, whispering lunar incantations dissolve the floors of memory and all its clear relations, its divisions and precisions every street lamp that i pass beats like a fatalistic drum and through the spaces of the dark midnight shakes the memory as a madman shakes a dead geranium half past one the street lamp sputtered the street lamp muttered the street lamp said 
regard that woman who hesitates towards you in the light of the door which opens on her like a grin you see the border of her dress is torn and stained with sand and you see the corner of her eye twist like a crooked pin the memory throws up high and dry a crowd of twisted things a twisted branch upon the beach eaten smooth and polished as if the world gave up the secret of its skeleton stiff and white a broken spring in a factory yard rust that clings to the form that the strength has left hard and curled and ready to snap half past two the street lamp said remark the cat which flattens itself in the gutter slips out its tongue and devours a morsel of rancid butter so the hand of the child automatic slipped out and pocketed a toy that was running along the key i could see nothing behind that child's eye i have seen eyes in the street trying to peer through lighted shutters and a crab one afternoon in a pool an old crab with barnacles on his back gripped the end of a stick which i held him half past three the lamp sputtered the lamp muttered in the dark the lamp hummed regard the moon la lune et garde aucun raccoon she winks a feeble eye she smiles into corners she smooths the hair of the grass the moon has lost her memory a washed out smallpox cracks her face her hand twists a paper rose that smells of dust and old cologne she is alone with all the old nocturnal smells that cross and cross across her brain the reminiscence comes of sunless dry geraniums and dust and crevices smells of chestnuts in the streets and female smells in shuttered rooms and cigarettes in corridors and cocktail smells in bars the lamp said four o'clock here is the number on the door memory you have the key the little lamp spreads a ring on the stair mount the bed is open the toothbrush hangs on the wall put your shoes at the door sleep prepare for life the last twist of the knife and a poem this recording is in the public domain morning at the window by t s eliot read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. They are rattling breakfast plates in basement kitchens, and along the trampled edges of the street I am aware of the damp soles of housemaids sprouting despondently at area gates. The brown waves of fog toss up to me twisted faces from the bottom of the street, and tear from a passer-by with muddy skirts an aimless smile that hovers in the air and vanishes along the level of the roofs and a poem this recording is in the public domain the boston evening transcript by t s eliot read for librivox dot org by larry wilson the readers of the Boston Evening Transcript sway in the wind like a field of ripe corn. When evening quickens faintly in the street, wakening the appetites of life in some, and to others bringing the Boston Evening Transcript, I mount the steps and ring the bell, turning wearily as one would turn to nod goodbye to Rochefoucauld. If the street were time, and he at the end of the street, and I say, Cousin Harriet, here is the Boston Evening Transcript. In the poem. This recording is in the public domain. Aunt Helen by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Fano Jangil. 
Aunt Helen. Miss Helen Slingsby was my maiden aunt, and lived in a small house near a fashionable square, cared for by servants to the number of four. Now when she died there was silence in heaven, and silence at her end of the street. The shutters were drawn and the undertaker wiped his feet. He was aware that this sort of thing had occurred before. The dogs were handsomely provided for. But shortly afterwards the parrot died too. The Dresden clock continued ticking on the mantelpiece, and the footman sat upon the dining table, holding the second housemaid on his knees, who had always been so careful while her mistress lived. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Cousin Nancy by T. S. Eliot Read for LibriVox.org by Fano Jahangiri Miss Nancy Ellicott strode across the hills and broke them, rode across the hills and broke them, the barren New England hills, riding to hounds over the cow pastures. Miss Nancy Ellicott smoked and danced all the modern dances, and her aunts were not quite sure how they felt about it, but they knew that it was modern. Upon the glazen shelves kept watch Matthew and Waldo, guardians of the faith, the army of unalterable law. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mr. Apollinax by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Fascio. When Mr. Apollinax visited the United States, his laughter tinkled among the teacups. I thought of Virgilian, that shy figure among the birch trees, and of Priapus in the shrubbery, gaping at the lady in the swing. In the palace of Mrs. Flaccus, at Professor Channing Cheetah's, he laughed like an irresponsible fetus. His laughter was submarine and profound, like the old man of the seas, hidden under coral islands, where worried bodies of drowned men drift down in the green silence, dropping from fingers of surf. I looked for the head of Mr. Apollinax rolling under a chair, or grinning over a screen with seaweed in its hair. I heard the beat of Centaur's hoofs over the hard turf, as his dry and passionate talk devoured the afternoon. He is a charming man, but, after all, what did he mean? His pointed ears, he must be unbalanced. There was something he said that I might have challenged. Of Dowager Mrs. Flaccus, and Professor and Mrs. Cheetah, I remember a slice of lemon and a bitten macaroon. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hysteria by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. As she laughed, I was aware of becoming involved in her laughter and being part of it, until her teeth were only accidental stars with a talent for squad drill. I was drawn in by short gasps, inhaled at each momentary recovery, lost finally in the dark caverns of her throat bruised by the ripple of unseen muscles an elderly waiter with trembling hands was hurriedly spreading a pink and white checkered cloth over the rusty green iron table saying if the lady and gentleman wish to take their tea in the garden if the lady and gentleman wish to take their tea in the garden i decided that if the shaking of her breast could be stopped, some of the fragments of the afternoon might be collected, and I concentrated my attention with careful subtlety to this end. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Conversation Galant by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Fano Jahangiri. I observe 
Our sentimental friend, the moon, or possibly, fantastic I confess, it may be Prester John's balloon, or an old battered lantern hung aloft, to light poor travellers to their distress. She then, how you digress. And I then, someone frames upon the keys, that exquisite nocturne, with which we explain the night and moonshine, music which we cease to body forth or vacuity. She then, does this refer to me? Oh no, it is I who am inane. You, madam, are the eternal humorist, the eternal enemy of the absolute, giving our vagrant moods the slightest twist, with your air indifferent and imperious, at a stroke or mad poetics to confute, and are we then so serious? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. La Filia K. Pianger by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo and Eva Davis. O quam tememorem, Virgo. Stand on the highest pavement of the stair. Lean on a garden urn. Weave, weave the sunlight in your hair. Clasp your flowers to you with a pained surprise. Fling them to the ground and turn with a fugitive resentment in your eyes. But weave, weave the sunlight, sunlight in, in your hair. hair. So I would have had him leave. So I would have had her stand and grieve. So he would have left, as the soul leaves the body torn and bruised, as the mind deserts the body it has used. I should find some way incomparably light and deft, some, some way, way we, we both, both should understand. understand, simple and faithless as a smile and a I shake of the hand. She turned away, but with the autumn weather compelled my imagination many days, many days and many hours, her hair over her arms and her arms full of flowers. And, and I, I wonder, wonder how they, they should have been, been together. together. I should have lost a gesture and a pose. Sometimes, Sometimes these cogitations, cogitations still amaze. amaze. The troubled midnight and the noon's repose. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of poems by T.S. Eliot.